So let me start kind of a weird way. How many of you, um, I'd like to take a little poll real quick. How many of you are here today and you actually enjoy going to a dentist? Could I see your hand? You enjoy going to one, two, three, four, five, 10, 12, 15 of you. Um, could I just lovingly say something to you? Um, you are emotionally disturbed people. <laughs> <laughs> Very lovingly, you know. Uh, go, going to a dentist is not a like for me, you know, but I, I go to a good dentist, I should say, and who has a good team, and I know it's an essential thing to do. And with all that said, I should note that I, I, I should tell you before I move along, I do believe it's possible for a dentist to go to heaven. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> Uh, I wondered for a while, but I do think it's about the grace of God is sufficient. So let me give you some observations about going to those six-month checkups um, that I, for me, that I've noticed is, um, so number one, they seem to happen every other month in my life. Um, secondly, no matter how wide I open my mouth, it's never wide enough for them. Now, I know, you're looking at me and you're thinking, how could that be with your mouth? But it's true. Um, and the third observation is, I've noticed that dentists do not seem to stop probing until they find something. And have you ever noticed that? They either probe until they find something or I gag. One or the other has to happen, it seems like. And when they mutter to themselves, it's never positive, you know. They kind of mutter to themselves with the mask and, and all that thing. And, and, and you know, I'll hear them say, oh, what do we have back there, you know. The fourth thing is, when the dentist turns the drill on, my stomach always gets upset. I just don't like the sound of the drill. You know, and I was thinking one day, if we could put a man on the moon... Do you think somebody could make a silent drill? Do you, do you think that could be possible? I think they have that thing with loudspeakers in the room, it seems to me. So um, what does this all have to do with anything, Pastor? I don't know. I just needed a little therapy this morning. And uh, there, I, I, I'm going to conclude this part of the message by saying I'd like to make a couple of quick op observations about being examined by a medical doctor as well. Quite honestly, my doctor might even be here this morning, but I'm still going to let him have it. The first thing I've noticed is that they're constantly building more rooms to wait in. I'm just saying, that seems to me. And uh, secondly, the worst thing about going to the doctor for me is their stupid scale. The scales always weigh more in the doctor's office than they do at my house. They always ask me before they put me on the scales, what do you weigh? And I say 165. <laughs> and they never believe me. So did you know that in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul gives an examination, not a physical one, but a spiritual examination. And when he talks about us in our sins or in our transgression, the exam does not come out very positive. And so I want to do the bad part first of this message, if that's okay. And we talk about one of the attributes of God, his grace. And we're going to talk about his grace because I really want you to have a renewed love and gratefulness for his grace in our lives. And how understanding his grace this morning should totally humble us all. So in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, Paul gives us what is called man's spiritual condition. And he tells us three things about our condition while living in sin, if you have your outline. I start at verse 1, Ephesians 2, 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. The first thing Paul says is, isn't this a positive note? We're dead. 
You're dead. What a positive thing to say. What he's, when he says that we're spiritually dead, what he means is that we're unable to appreciate or understand spiritual values. We are dead in Christ. Before we are sa- truly saved, Before we're truly born of the Spirit, God transformed our heart. We had nothing to do with that. We repented. We understood that there's a gift that's available. He made the gift possible. And and, um, we understand that before this truly happened, we were dead. We were separated from God. Sin separated us. We were unable to appreciate the things of God in our lives. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 13 and 13. I want to read this verse, and I want you to catch it because it's very, very helpful. Jesus says, that is why I use these parables, for they look, they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. Do you know what it is to have a child sometimes who's hearing you, but doesn't hear you? who see something, but they don't really see what they need to be seeing. Do you understand that that's how God views us sometimes? We're hearing some of you right now. You're listening to me, but you may not be listening. Jesus is saying this about those who have mental faculties, and yet they do not understand what they're hearing or what they're seeing. And this is what Paul says when he examines us. He says, we're all in trouble spiritually. We fail the exam. In fact, he says, we are dead. Now, this message will get better. But hang on. Back in the beginning with Adam and Eve, they were permitted so many beautiful things, but there was one tree which they were not permitted to partake of. And God said, if you partake of that tree, you will die. He meant that they would die physically, which they did, but he also meant they would die spiritually. Their relationship with God would be severed. When Satan approached Eve about the same issue, what did Satan say? Do you remember what Satan said about the same issue? He said to Eve, he said, you shall not surely die. In fact, he said that if she would partake of that tree, her eyes would be opened. Isn't that interesting? And you see the parallel of Matthew and what Jesus says? In fact, he said that if she would partake of that tree, her eyes would be opened, and he sold her this bill of goods, and that is the same thing Satan tries to do with all of us today. It's the same thing. He told her instead of dying, she would live. Instead of being blinded, her eyes would be opened. But the exact opposite happened. She partook and not only died, but there came a glaze over her eyes and her ears. And that's why Paul says that in our spiritual state, we're dead. We may walk, we may talk, we may interact, but we're dead. The second thing, about our condition as we kind of take this examination this morning and that was my crude introduction of a dentist and a medical doctor to kind of get us to uh, take a spiritual examination today is that Paul also says not only are we dead but we are disobedient in fact disobedience always follows people who are spiritually dead in their sin Paul says There are three three reasons that we're disobedient. The first thing he says is the world. Verse 2, Ephesians 2, 2, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the... He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. In other words, when we're spiritually dead and living in disobedience, we then cave into the pressures of the world, the value system of the world, and the priorities of the world. When we're dead, and when we're, because we're dead, we're disobedient, and that leads to caving to the pressures of the world the value system of this world, the priorities of this world. There are people here today. You're here. 
I would say that God's in pursuit of you or you would not even be here. There, there's some good news about you even coming into this place or you'd p- probably find a reason not to be here if you're not saved. Romans 12, 1 and 2, he tells us not to allow the world to squeeze us into its mold. The moment we let the world squeeze us into its mold, we begin to think and react like the world and we're in big trouble. Jesus said in John 17, 15, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. The evil of this world, if we allow it, can cause us to disobey the Lord. There's a second reason that we're disobedient besides the world that Paul tells us about The second one is Satan himself. Verse two says he's the commander of the powers in the unseen world. The NASB, the New American Standard Bible, says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air and his chief tool, his chief tool, by the way, oh, please know this, Satan's chief tool in your life is lying to you. That's his chief thing, to lie to you. But I want you to know he may be the prince of the power of the air, but there's still only one king of kings and there's still only one lord of lords. That prince is a wannabe king and he's never going to make it because there's only one king. Satan is selling us a bill of goods. And that's what he did to Adam and Eve. And that's what he's done throughout the generations of mankind. And I promise you that's what he's trying to do to all of us and what he has done to all of us. Jesus said this about Satan in John 8, 44. Are y'all glad you came to the house of God this morning? All right, let's keep going. It's gonna get better. Here's what he said about Satan in John 8, 44. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Every lie that has ever been said from the lips of mankind has begun or had its seed in Satan himself. He makes sin look good and enticing, but if we get involved in it, we'll find out that it's isolating. Sin always separates. Sin always brings isolation. I had a man literally tell me one time when I shared with him the gospel and I invited him to the altar of God's grace and mercy in his life and he said this to me. He said, I don't know, I think I want to go to hell and be with all my friends. And what he doesn't understand is hell is the most lonely place there will ever be. He won't be with his friends. Sin and hell and all that the devil has planned, he tells us a lie because it's the opposite. It's dark and lonely and there will be no friendship in hell. Back to our spiritual examination. When we disobey God, It's because of the world system and because of Satan. And thirdly, Paul says it's because of the flesh. Verse 3 says, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. The NASB says that we formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind. When Paul speaks of the flesh, He's not speaking of our physical body. He's speaking of our nature. He's not talking about necessarily the flesh that is hanging on the skeleton of our bones. He's talking about our nature, our carnal nature. Because of Adam and Eve, we're born into this world as sinners, and and we've all sinned. So, So you were born into sin with the sin nature in your bloodline, And you sinned, double trouble. All have sinned, the Bible says, not some. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
We have a sinful nature that drags us down if we're without Jesus. It's the world, it's Satan, and it's the flesh or our sinful nature that can cause us to disobey God. The third thing about our condition when we're living in sin is that we're not only dead and we're disobedient, but thirdly, we're doomed. The last part of verse 3, Paul says, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger. That is not a good thing to be subject to. God's anger, God's wrath. Some may think here this morning right now, Pastor, why such a dark picture? What are you doing? This, this is not a very encouraging message so far. Pastor, I go through a lot all week. I don't need to come here and, and hear all this. I need somebody to tell me how wonderful I am. Hold on. Why such a dark picture? It's very simple. Paul, Paul understands this, that unless we see our situation as being desperate, we'll never take the medicine that we need. If we think that all we have is a common cold, we'll treat it mentally as a common cold. Paul says if we could truly understand that we are terminal, we're in trouble spiritually, then we could understand how badly we need God's remedy in our lives. And I want to tell you, God has a remedy for this. And if you're new to faith today, it may not be what you think. This remedy begins in verse 4 of our text, and he shows us the heart of God in verse 4. And Paul says, he stops, and he says, but God, oh, I love, I love those two words, but God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much. Okay, we're dead, we're disobedient, we're doomed, this is looking hopeless, but God. Whew. I got a good chill running right down my spine. God's goodness and mercy, just thinking about it. But God. Paul gives us a picture of a God who is rich in mercy. Man, you sang that song today. I didn't even catch that you were singing that song today. What can wash away my sins? I, I had a, a little fit over there while you were doing that song. I'm sorry, not a fit, a benefit. I had a, a little benefit over there. A God who will not give us what we deserve. That's his mercy. His mercy says, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. Oh, somebody ought to say, thank you, Jesus. In verse 5 and 6, Paul talks about God's actions. He says that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Now our identification with Christ gives us life. We've been raised from the dead and God, the Bible says right there, I just read it to you, and God seated us with Jesus. That's relationship. He seated us with Jesus. We're going to have lunch today at my house and celebrate my baby boy's birthday. 21 years old was on Friday, but we're celebrating today with all the family. And I just may have him sit by dad. <laughs> I just might gush on him while he's trying to eat his taco. I might just kiss him right on the cheek in front of his girlfriend. <laughs> I 
and think back about how God allowed Riley to be my son. Relationship. And now Paul tells us that God's purpose is twofold. I thought about saying it a different way, and I'm going to say it this way. It could be taken wrong in, in our culture today, but I'm going to say it this way. First, God's purpose when he saved you. Now, now hold on. Let me explain it a minute. His purpose is to show us off. Verse 7 says, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of his incredible, of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. In other words, God wants to show us off that here's what my grace and my mercy can do in somebody's life. That's amazing to me. Sinful, disobedient mankind, and God is thrilled with his gift in us. You know, it's kind of like a grandparent who has pictures of a grandchild and just loves to share those pictures all the time. It's like, okay, I have seen it enough already. Thank you. That's enough. You know. <laughs> what? Grandparents, if I've ever dissed you in your whole life when you showed me your pictures, I'm sorry. I get it now. And by the way, little Eliza, put that picture back up there for a moment again, please. Thank you very much. Go ahead. She's going to have a little sister in July. You guys aren't even going to be able to put up with me with two, man, I'll tell you. I don't know. Pastor Jeff, I don't even know if I'll be able to come to work. In some weird way, it's kind of helped me understand God's love towards us. So, God's purpose is twofold. He wants to show us off. Secondly, God wants to save us. God wants to save you. Verse 8 says, God, man, I can barely read my notes. My eyes have glazed over, and hopefully in a good way, not a bad way, like we've been talking about. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. God offers us his grace. You know what I'm so thankful about that is? You know what God could have offered us? And it had been right. His justice. We ought to be all so thankful he didn't offer us his justice. He's just. He's a just God. And justice means this. Justice means that I get what I deserve. Ooh, don't want that. Isn't this humbling? When you, when you just go back, and some of you have heard this message in various forms through maybe decades, some of you. But isn't it humbling to go back and realize that God could have offered you his justice, and you could have got what you deserved, and nobody could really argue the point. He could have only given you his mercy. So his justice is get what you deserve. His mercy is, okay, God says, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. That's pretty good. How many are, anybody grateful in here that you're, from God, you're not getting what you do deserve? 
That's his mercy. Justice is getting what you do deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And instead, he saves you by his grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. What are we getting? Salvation. Life more abundantly. A relationship with Jesus that lasts for eternity. A transformed heart that desires to please the Lord. Yes, we're in a battle with this flesh, with the enemy, with the world. But when the Lord truly saves us, he wins. To those who deserve death, he offers life. When my oldest boy was four, Reese, he's going to be 24 this year, when he was four, I was studying at home after I put him to bed one night, and he starts getting in and out of bed, finding every reason to get out of bed. I'm studying. Mom's at choir practice. Got up to get a drink, and then he got up to go to the bathroom. There's a parallel there. <laughs> and after about three times, I said to him, Reese, go to bed, son, and stay in bed. And if you get up again, you're in trouble. And I was studying, and it wasn't long, and I heard little feet. He was up again. And I went to his room. He didn't see me, and I, I got to the doorway of his room just in time to see him doing a leap from the top of the dresser into the bed. I taught him that when mom wasn't around. <laughs> I was um, living my dreams through my son. I was always too big to do it myself. <laughs> As he's flying through the air like Superman, he caught me out of the corner of his eye. And he knew he was in trouble. He dives into bed, throws the covers over his head, Um, well, pulls him up to his head, and I see him close his eyes, and he's there with his eyes closed. And I go over and sit on the bed, and I just look at him, and I know it's going to kill him not to open his eyes at some point. It's, it's, it's going to kill him. He's going to have to open it. And he just couldn't stand it. And after a moment or so, he opened his eyes. True story. He sees me. And he immediately reaches out to me and puts his arms around me and said, let's pray, Dad. <laughs> My four-year-old boy understood grace. <laughs> and he tried to manipulate grace that day. It's funny, but... Don't we sometimes try to manipulate God's grace? We as men and women try to save ourselves. We try to pick ourselves up by our own boots and save ourselves. And the truth is we can't do it. We try to sell ourselves a lie from Satan that we can save ourselves. L let me give you four common ways we try to save ourselves in the world. The first two don't relate to us a ton in America. They do some for some people, but self-infliction is one. If we study any of the major religions of the world, we'll find out that all of them try to save themselves through some type of self-infliction. Uh, human sacrifice is another one. Many religions of the world have people sacrificing themselves for a promised reward for their families or for themselves in the afterlife. How deceived they are. It's so sad how much deception there is. The next two ways that we try to save ourselves in the world, we, we can understand more here in America. 
very common things in America. Third is doing good things. I, I would say that I have battled that one in my life because growing up as a young Roman Catholic boy, it became innate within me in the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church for, as a young age that salvation was by works. People filling their lives with good works thinking that's going to save them. I would challenge all of us to consider knowing that not, none of your good works can get you saved. Now, good works after you're saved and born of the Spirit, good works have a fabulous retirement plan. But none of them will get you there. It's a, it's a byproduct of knowing that the Lord truly saved you because, you know, when I see people that say they're saved and they attend church regularly and they even become a member and they're not serving actively at some point. Now, some people need to come here and take a powder. They need, uh, do you know what I mean by that? They need to come here and, and just take a break. They need to take a minute. They need some healing. They need restoration from whatever they've come from sometimes. But I'll tell you, people who have eventually don't find a way to serve the body of Christ, to serve their families, to serve the Lord, they need to question their salvation. I don't need to come along and tell you you're not saved. You need... The Bible says to check out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's amazing how many people try to climb a ladder to salvation through good works. They're a good person, a good neighbor. They're a good friend. You ask them, hey, are you saved? Well, I try to be a good person. I didn't ask you that. They abide by the golden rule and they would never harm someone. Somehow it's very common for many Christians to still think they're saved by good works over God's grace. Paul said in verses 8 and 9, God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation, look at salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. You know what? When we're all in heaven someday, if you're saved, and we're in heaven someday, you know one of the things there's not going to be in heaven? There's going to be no boasting about how wonderful we are and how we got there because of how wonderful we are. There'll be none of that boasting in heaven. Here's the fourth one that people try to earn salvation. Religious ritual. If good works is the one that people get sucked into the most, this is the one that hurts the most. I've known people who think that if they can go to church, they'll go to heaven. Or if they get baptized, they'll go to heaven. If they give money, they'll go to heaven. Please understand, we can attend a church service every Sunday and do all of the things that I just mentioned and split hell wide open. I remember the guy, uh, the story of this guy, I think I've told it a long time ago, the story of a guy who died and was standing at the pearly gates. And he met St. Peter, and Peter said, in order to come in here, you've got to have a thousand points. And the guy said, well, I think I can come up with a thousand points from my life. And Peter got a pen and a piece of paper out and said, okay, let's hear it. He said, okay. He said, well, I went to church every Sunday, Peter said, well, good, that's 25 points. And the guy said, well, I gave the Lord my tithe every week. Good, Peter said, 25 points. The guy said, I taught the children for many years. And Peter said, wow, good for you, 25 points. And the guy said, I was a good neighbor and I helped my neighbors when they needed me. And Peter said, good, that's another 25 points. And the guy thought for a minute and said, Peter, I've given you the best stuff I've got, and I've only accumulated a hundred points. It's going to take the grace of God for me to get to heaven, or I'll never make it. And Peter said, Yes, the grace of God, 900 points. Come on in. 
This tells me that points will never be enough. When we all get our points tallied, it won't even be close to enough. It's by grace that we are saved through faith, and that's what Paul was trying to tell all of us. It's by grace, it's not by our good works. It's not how good of a person we are. It's not by who we know, not by where we go. It's by God's grace. And grace comes from the Greek word which means gift or unmerited favor. Max Lucado says, if we fear we've written too many checks on God's kindness account, drag regrets around like a broken bumper, huff and puff more than we delight in rest, and most of all, if we wonder whether God can do something with the mess of our lives, then it's his grace that we need. I want to pray. For those who would, are here right now and say, Pastor, I'm beginning to understand the devil's lies in my life. I'm beginning to understand that when I understand the grace of God, it's now causing me to humble myself and realize that we live in a world where we all try to pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we all try to succeed and we all try to be successful. But my prayer is today that there are many of you in this congregation this morning that have come to the realization that we cannot earn saving faith. It's a gift of God. That no matter where you may have come from here this morning, how long you've come to Calvary or not, what church you were raised in or not raised in, There's one way to a relationship with the Lord. And that's by the faith he gave you to believe and the gift of God's grace in your life. Well, pastor, what do I do? You really can't do anything except, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. I'm sorry that I put you on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for even allowing me to sit in this service and allow the faith that you're giving me to swell inside of my heart. To just reach out and receive the gift and say, yes, Lord, I receive. Would you bow your heads for a moment? How many of you are here across this room? I want to pray for you. I'm not here to try to embarrass anybody, but hey, Jesus died in front of the whole world on a cross, stark naked. For you, for me. I wonder how many across this room this morning would say, Pastor, Pray for me that I would receive the most precious gift there is. The grace of God in my life, Jesus Christ, and would receive him. Your heads are bowed. How many would just say, that's me, Pastor? Lift your hand and put it back down so I just know who you are. Yes, 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 yes. I see your hands. Anyone else, you can put your hands down after you raise them. Yes, I see your hand. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're going to pray. Anybody else before we pray? Anybody else say, I, I want to be included, Pastor. I, I want to know that I know 
All right, look up at me, everyone. I'm going to do something that we don't do every week. But I'm going to, in just a moment, have everybody to stand. And I'd ask you to stay around for just a moment. We're going to leave. But I want... See, I know some of you have answered God's call in your life, but your hand was up. And I know it's because God's doing this great work in your life. You know, there was a time when I prayed for this guy, Pastor Jeff, he came to the altar. Every time I give an altar call, he came forward to get saved. And I was like, man, don't you know you're saved? And one day I kind of was frustrated with him a little bit. And I said, why are you still coming down? Aren't you saved? Here's what he told me. It changed my life. He said, you know, every time my whole life the devil had something for me, I got in line. And he said, Pastor, when you give an altar call, I just want more of all that God has for me. Devil deceived me for years and I just want more. I know if you're saved, you're saved. But I, don't you think God just loves something about that kind of a heart? It says, Lord, more of you. So when we stand, I'm gonna ask all of you that raised your hand, some of you may be saved, but your hand went up and you said, I want more. God knows where you are. Some of you are recommitting yourself to the things of God. Some of you are realizing, man, I'm trying to stand on my own two feet in this salvation. And today I realize I need to lean on the Lord. He's my only hope. Whatever you raise your hand, maybe this is your first time to answer an altar call. We want to celebrate with you. And I want to just shake your hand and I want to not that I'm anything, but I want to put my hand on your head and I want to pray God's blessings on you before we go. All right, everybody stand. And if you raised your hand, come on down and don't wait for somebody else. The devil will talk you out of it. And come on down here and we're going to pray together and we're going to celebrate. Can we celebrate while people are coming and thank the Lord for his saving grace in our lives? Isn't the Lord awesome, Tom? Lord's so good, isn't he? Rich. Rich. He's rich. God is so rich in his love for you, man. Bless you guys. Lord's hand is on you, honey. He's working in your heart. Bless you, brother. What's your name? Eugene. I sense the Lord working in you, man. Isn't that a good thing? Man, the Lord just doing such awesome stuff in you guys. I just have sensed it for weeks. The Lord's... There's nothing like it when God gets a hold of us. Isn't it good? It's good, isn't it? Yes, it is. Blessing you guys. Let's pray. I'm glad you're here, man. The devil's tried to take you out many times. Here you are. I'm praying the Lord's going to give you clarity of mind, emotion. He's going to strengthen your life. I'm so glad you're coming here. I love you, brother. Love you too. Let's pray together. Pray this from your heart, everybody. Pray out loud. Why don't everybody in the audience pray with those for strength for those? If you know anybody up here or you're an elder and want to just come stand behind somebody, I would just love for you to do that. Put your hand on their shoulder. Let's pray out loud. Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace. I'm not worthy of it in myself but you made me worthy to receive your goodness I'm sorry Lord I have sinned 
I have fallen short of all that you have for me. I am humbled today to know that you reached out to me and you gave me faith to believe that Jesus is my only hope. And so by faith, I receive the gift of salvation in my life. And I confess that you are Lord and Savior. And with your help, I'm going to serve you all the days of my life. And if I should stumble, if I should mess up, and you know me, Lord, I probably will. Give me this faith to not stay down, but get back up and keep on keeping on in this journey of faith in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Lord, as I put my hand on my brothers and sisters, May you put your hand on them right now. Strengthen them, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill them with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Baptize them in love and let them walk in the strength and power of God and let them recognize that the strength they have is not from themselves, but it is from you, that you have given them all that they need, Lord, to walk a victorious life in Christ Jesus. We pray and we thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord praise one more time. I love you all. I bless you in the Lord and uh, continue on in the Lord and let us help you and come alongside you in any way we can. You are dismissed. God bless you richly.